Um, Pastor Mike is one of the very first missionaries we took on as a, as a church, Church of Skyline. Um, and I'm not going to sit here and tell you the story because I don't want to take away from him. But he, uh, he, he really impressed me with, with what he did. And I've actually used the illustration here with the, the muddy water turning into the clear water. And then he drank it. That really impressed me. So I really wanted to get to know this guy. I met him back in 2003 on a mission trip with Pastor Lauren, actually. And I was scared of him. I mean, he's kind of intimidating. Look at him. He scared me. And I'm like, he comes up to me, he says, I hear you could play the guitar. I said, yeah. He said, how about doing worship? Yes, sir, I will. You know, we, we had a bunch of kids on a mission trip. And uh, so anyway, so got involved with him uh, back around 2008, eight, nine, something like that with this water filter ministry. And uh, he's an amazing man. He is, a, he is a spiritual brother to me. He's a mentor to me. So I ask that you give him your full attention, your full respect, because I know he has a word from the Lord today. Give him a hand. Thank you, buddy. Uh, thank you. Now you know why I keep coming back, because, you know, they just say all those nice things about me. It's kind of a, kind of a, um, an ego boost. How many of y'all know we all need that once in a while? We all need um, somebody to tell us good things, because, you know, it's really easy to tell people bad things. But I've always believed that you can find something good about just about anybody if you just really try. And sometimes if you speak those things into their life or sell those things about them, it really uh, helps them and encourages them. In fact, the Bible says a kind word turns away wrath or a soft answer turns away wrath. And uh, it also says merry heart does good like a medicine. So I don't know where uh, Lauren went, but we were, we were yakking it up just a little bit this morning and got chastised by your worship leader, but uh, we stood our ground. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It is so good to be here. Um, as, you know, what's really cool is every time I come, there's something different. Your foyer looks amazing, by the way. I know you did more than just the foyer, but it looks amazing. And um, all the different things you're doing, I know, I believe a school has spawned. <laughs> and is that the right word? Spawned? Is that okay? Yeah, I had this with kids. They kind of Anyhow, I won't go there, but um, it's, it's just amazing up here on the hill. It's a beautiful drive, and every time I come up, I, 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 like, I, I don't get tired of looking at this. This is, this is beautiful country, um, beautiful folks, and so I appreciate so much the opportunity. I always feel welcome. I come in, and I get the double-door treatment. I know all of you get the double-door treatment, but I got the double-door treatment, and, um, and it's good to see family and friends. It's good to see Eric and Amanda here. Stand up real quick. You know, last time before here, they, they've now since been married. Yeah. So it's, um, you know, Eric serves on our board of directors for Hope 21, and uh, he drove over the mountain all the way from, um, I don't even know where y'all live now, West Virginia. I think you live in, nope, Maryland. Okay. Okay, well, they're close. Okay, well, anyhow, they came across the mountain, drove by, I uh, drove to be with us this morning, and he does such a good job, and it's so good that he has a partner now that will keep him straight. So I, I haven't had to do any work since uh, Amanda came into his life, but uh, really good to have Thank you for coming this morning. It's good to see so many of you. Um, as you all know, it has been a challenging 2020, and Hope 21 has faced its own challenges I will, I'm really pleased to report that financially the Lord has just continued to bless. People have remained faithful. We didn't lose a lot of support, some. Um, and then we took some other measures. Um, I took a job, a real job. Actually, I'm not just a preacher anymore. I took a real job and I, I drive a truck. I drive a truck five days a week. Monday through Friday, and um, I want to tell you it's been interesting because uh, it's been a long time. I pastored for and was in full-time ministry for over 30 years, and and uh, I have a greater appreciation, especially for um, for you, because I never really, it never really, I never connected the dots when I would come and find people exhausted. I then, you know, I was always trying to pump everybody up and understand why everybody was just kind of has days looked on their face sometimes, especially why people wouldn't come on Wednesday night and why they didn't come to uh, the Saturday building program and the breakfast and the women's meeting and y'all know what I'm talking about. And then I started working five days a week and I'm like, I get it now, I'm tired. And, um, and so, but it's been a great, you know, I've really been introduced to a different culture and, um, I will tell you that I've probably done as much, if not more, ministry um, is, since I started working full-time. And I don't know how long I'll work full-time. I don't know how long this season will last. 
And uh, my body doesn't really enjoy it, but I will tell you my soul and my spirit, uh, I love it. I love the um, I love the people that I work with and I've, I've officiated a, a funeral and um, a lot of them ask me questions. They call me PM, pa Preacher Mike, not Pastor Mike. They call me Preacher Mike. And uh, I, I, I like that, though. And I like being and having the opportunity um, to be a light in darkness. And I believe the darker the darkness, the brighter the light. And uh, God is really calling us. I'll share that message with you this morning um, uh, along these lines about how important it is to really let our light shine. To really not cover it up, not put it under a bushel, not, you know, not um, hide it away in any way, but to really let our light shine in the, in, in the environment in which we live. And hopefully it'll be encouraging to you. I'll say some heavy things. I'm just going to prepare you right now. I'll say some heavy things because uh, our ministry has shifted a little bit. As I said, we're not doing um, water filters overseas right now. It's all kind of hit the pause button because no one is going. Very few people are going. We're starting to see just a little bit. We've sent some water filters that are headed to Kenya um, this month here in November. And um, that's, uh, that's the first batch that's gone out in eight or nine months. But we have redirected some of our funds to help uh, feeding programs that are already in place. Because a lot of times with the water filters, we came along the feeding programs because if you make food out of water and you use bad water, you have bad what? Food. <laughs> so um, we are, we've come alongside those and began to shift uh, money uh, into um, some feeding programs. And it's all because of your faithfulness. Your church has been so faithful and uh, you have made a difference, made an impact. So we have a new video that uh, Pastor Butch actually went down to Louisiana with me and we shot, uh, I shot this video and then he, he kind of photobombed me. Um, and so he's, his mug is actually stuck in this video. I tried to talk to the guy about not putting it in there, but it, so we're going to actually show, um, this, uh, promo video. It's our newest one. You're the first church to see it. I just actually got it last night. And so, um, I hope it turns out. Here we go. Over three and a half million people die every single year from drinking contaminated water. What if you lived in that community? What if that was someone that you cared for and someone that you loved? What if? Over half the world's hospital beds are filled with people with diseases from drinking contaminated water. What if that were you? What if that was someone that you loved? What if? What if? Over 4,000 children die every single day from drinking contaminated water. What if that were your child or your grandchild? What if? What if? What if you could make a difference? What if you could change a life? What if the solution wasn't that difficult? I think that all of us, you know, want to make a difference. And if we can change a life, well, that's something powerful. Let me take just a few moments and share with you a little bit about Hope 21 Ministries. Hope 21 Ministries is dedicated and committed to being that simple solution to people around the world that are hurting, especially as it pertains to water-related crisis. You know, as we've heard all these stats, we've seen that over three and a half million people die. We can make a difference with that. And one of the ways that we're doing at Hope 21 Ministries is we are using this small, powerful, point of use water filter. This water filter right here, it filters out over 99.9% .9 of all microbacteria that makes people sick, especially children. It's inexpensive, it costs around 30 bucks for a kit. It requires no electricity, it's uh, gravity fed, it's versatile, it can go in your luggage, it can go with a missions team, it can go to a missionary, it can get to the field and get to the places that need it the most. This filter is tough, it's long lasting, it can last up to 10 years. This water filter saves lives, it does change lives. 
it does make a difference, but it also opens up the opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ because when you help somebody in such great need, when you meet somebody at their greatest point of need in their life, they're open and they're willing to listen to the good news of Jesus Christ. And we all know that the good news of Jesus Christ goes beyond the body and it affects the soul. Their souls are touched. Their bodies and their minds and their hearts are transformed by the goodness and the grace of Jesus Christ. If you would like to know more about Hope 21 Ministries, you can visit our table, you can check out one of the brochures, you can watch our demo, or you can go to our website at hope21ministries.com and you can check us out. I thank you so much for your time and I thank you for your prayers. May God bless you. What do y'all think? All right. All right. You know, you guys, um, you, you're doing that, and you are making a difference. And it is, it is a simple, uh, inexpensive solution. In fact, right now in our warehouse, we have 500 water filters that you guys have already paid for, and they're just waiting. They're, I, I, God's going to open the right door at the right time, and it'll get to the right place, and we, we trust in that, but you've done that. You guys have been so encouraging and such a blessing to Hope 21 Ministries. And there are other churches that are partnered together, but doing this thing together, it's just amazing what, what can happen. And if you're new and you haven't seen this in action, there's the table back there. There's also um, there's some swamp water that I brought up from Dinwiddie, Virginia. I said Dinwiddie. Someone said, you live in Dinwiddie? I said, no, Dinwiddie with an N. And, um, but you guys can try some, sample some. I've been drinking this now. Eric's been drinking this now for six years or something like that. And we've not got sick yet. In fact, I have a feeling it might cure the Corona. <laughs> Come on, somebody say amen. <laughs> well, we know Trump would say that for sure. Um, but, uh, and maybe it will. Uh, it's, uh, it's an awesome thing um, that, that really got us. And I just wanted to say thank you. I like to come and report back to churches that sponsor us and say, this is where your investment is going. And um, anything that, any monies that are given that are designated to water filters and or food, 100% of it goes there. And so um, that's, a, that's a good thing. Not too many people can say that. Not too many ministries can say that. But if you designate it, you write out uh, that, that or give that or your church gives that and says this is what we want it for. And so thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor Butch, for, for um, being so passionate about it. Pastor Butch, um, you know, he's on our leadership team uh, with this ministry, and I appreciate his investment, his belief in that. And thank you. Can I just say thank you? Can you just give yourself and the Lord a hand? <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want to share a message uh, entitled The Power to Persevere. And uh, it's a um, really a lesson from Coach Hag. I'm going to call him Coach Hag this morning. We're going to be in the book of Haggai. You can turn on your Bibles to the book of Haggai or turn in your Bibles to the book of Haggai. And uh, we're going to be talking a little bit and, and hopefully being motivated. You know, um, how many of y'all can use some motivation? Come on, how many of y'all can use some motivation? Not a lot of that going around. Not a lot of people handing that out. But, but um, we also need some inspiration. And um, I'll, I'll share with you why I think it's so important that we have that. One of my favorite basketball players, I don't know how many basketball, college basketball fans were here. I've been a lifelong um, University of Virginia Cavalier basketball fan. And, um, you know, last year or the last time they played, uh, they won the national championship. And they had a, a guard on there by the name of Kyle Guy. How many, I don't know how many of y'all, any basketball fans in here in this ring of the bell? Kyle Guy. Anyhow, 
the, their coach, Tony Bennett, uh, he's, a, he's a born again Christian believer and he really, you know, wears his, his, uh, his faith on his sleeve and he impacts his young men. He puts a lot of things into them and he really teaches them a lot of things about life. And one of the things when Kyle Guy was being interviewed after they won the national championship, you have to understand, let me frame this just for a second. The year before, they were the number one team in the nation, and they, they were favored to win it all, and they were knocked out by a number 16 seed in the, first, in the first round. First time a number 16 seed had ever beat a number one seed. And so bouncing back from that the following year, they, they, they got it and they won the national championship. So it was a great story. Um, about perseverance. It's a great story about getting up off the mat and, and um, you know, not letting uh, yourself wallow in discouragement and defeat, but getting up. And so they were interviewing him, this young uh, guard, Kyle Guy, about, uh, you know, about what, what was it? And he says, you know, what motivated you all season? And he said something that caught my ear, and I, I didn't know I would ever use it, but I, I'm going to use it this morning in this message. And this was his statement when he was answering that. He said, well, uh, we learned that inspiration is even better than motivation. He said, this is his quote. He says, motivation is short-term, but inspiration is long-term. He said, we weren't just motivated, but we were inspired, and that inspiration carried us uh, to this point we're at now. And, um, you know, I thought to myself, there's a lot of truth to that, that motivation, and I hope today, I hope that the words that I, you know, share with you, I hope the water filters and that ministry, Hope 21, I hope it's all motivating to you. I would be disappointed if you didn't go out here motivated to go out and to do better and to be better and to make a difference. I would be disappointed if you weren't motivated to persevere no matter what you're facing because all of you face something in your life and some are at points and places where you feel like giving up or what's the use or you feel like just uh, remaining uh, stuck in a rut or whatever it is, but I hope I motivate you today. But I also know that my words and my preaching, whatever it is, motivation will only take you but so far. We need more than motivation, we need inspiration. And so I'm gonna share just a little bit about that, power to persevere. In the book of Haggai, um, I'm gonna try to shorten this up a little bit. I'm not gonna read, even though it's a very short, one of the minor prophets, a very short um, book, only two chapters long, only 38 verses long. And I wanna look at chapter two, I wanna read that. And then I want to play something for you, another little video clip. And I want to set that little video clip up. And we're going to try to pull it off Facebook here in just a second. But uh, in chapter 2 of the book of Haggai, uh, we're going to be starting in verse 2. Uh, this is Haggai the prophet speaking to the children of Israel, speaking to the leadership, speaking to the governor and the priest. And he says, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatil, governor of Judea, and to jo Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, verse 3, Who was left among you who saw this temple in its former glory, and how do you see it now? In comparison with it, is this not in your eyes as nothing? Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong, all you people in the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts, according to the word that I am coveted with you, uh, when, you come, when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you, and do not fear, for thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, I will shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill the temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. And verse 9 says, The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Pray with me. Jesus, I pray for the next few moments that truly we would go beyond being motivated and that we would be inspired. I pray, Father, that you, the great, uh, uh, powerful, and mighty one who breathes inspiration to us, that you would breathe into us, Lord, through your word, by your word, by the authority of your word, but by your spirit, Lord, that you would breathe to us and that we would be strengthened and encouraged and blessed. 
and that you would fill this temple, each of us, with your glory. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Amen. I want to show you, um, before we play that, but I want to show you this video clip. Uh, I've had the privilege of, of going to Vietnam um, on two different missions trips. Any Vietnam vets that we have here this morning, any Vietnam vets, if you could raise your hand. All right, if you raise your hand. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not put you on the spot, but I want you to stand real quick, if you will, two Vietnam vets, if you don't mind. And I want us to give these vets um, just an applause. I know they don't like this. Thank you for your service. Thank you. You know, my dad was a Vietnam vet. He flew helicopters in Vietnam. Um, he served two tours there. Um, he passed away in 2001. Um, and I, I'm proud to be the son of a vet. And I had the privilege to go, uh, like I said, uh, on to, to Vietnam. And it was an incredible trip. I don't have time to say about it, but I just I know this. I have a special place in my heart for Vietnam vets. They are, they were the most underappreciated veterans ever. And, you know, maybe just now in the last several years have they begin, begin to get the recognition and the acknowledgement for the sacrifice of, of, of what they did and what they went through. And many, many of uh, their uh, brothers and sisters in arms didn't come back. And I know that, um, that that's a, a lot of difficulties had surrounded that. But I want to say this because I, I want to, you know, I've heard it said that, you know, Vietnam was the only war that the U.S. has ever lost, but that's really not true. That is a lie. I'll be honest. It was, an, it was a lie. One, it wasn't lost. You may not have been allowed to win it like you should have been, but you certainly didn't lose it. Um, but I want you to know that sometimes things aren't always as they seem on the surface because I believe ultimately God is in control. And one of the things that I experienced when I was in Vietnam, and it was shared with me by um, uh, a Vietnamese pastor who said, do you realize that for the 10 years that the U.S. was there, that there was a safety net or a wall created for uh, missionaries to come in and to hold uh, crusades and to preach and many Vietnamese gave their hearts to Christ during that time. They they were underground. No one saw it. You know, it wasn't it wasn't made a big deal. But I want to tell you, during your time, during during the time of the uh, United States presence there, um, there were seeds that were sown that are coming to fruition today. And what I want to show you is this: is that even though. Um, you know, communi that's a communist, co communistic country now and that um, an open church and, and a freedom in worship is illegal there now. Um, we were chased out of, a, out of a service. We had to duck and run from the authorities when I was there, jumped in a van and headed out. This was, you know, this is what, in the midst of all of that discouragement and darkness, Something pretty cool has happened. Now, what you're going to see right here is a worship service. And so we're going to go ahead and play this. And I just want you to just take it in for a moment and because it's going to bring me to a point that I'd like to make. Let's see if we can pull that up. If not, I'm going to sing it for you. <laughs> I'm just kidding because <laughs> I'm not. So well, we have sound. You gotta love technology, right? Well, we'll listen to it for a few seconds. If you can hear, I mean, you can't understand it's in, it's in Vietnamese. Um, this is about three or 4,000 uh, Vietnamese worshiping Jesus Christ. So. <laughs> Somebody's happy, aren't they? <laughs> Oh, 
It's okay. How many all can understand hallelujah? So we can't. That's right. That's right. I don't understand the other stuff. There you go. All right, well, let's give the Lord a hand anyhow, because he's, he's always worthy. I was, I was in that worship service, and it, I just, it was, they weren't allowed to have a worship service. They weren't allowed to have a church service, so, but they were allowed to have a concert. And so that was a Christian concert, and we, they, just, they just cut loose. And they just threw caution to the wind and began to praise the Lord. In the midst of all that resistance, in the middle of all of that, um, you know, restrictions, all of that, well, they praised the Lord anyhow. And, you know, it's just, it was, and that was just a tiny sample. Um, they weren't allowed to pray, but they were allowed to um, converse with one another. And so uh, they had everybody turn and to pray for one another. And I want to tell you, the Spirit of God just fell in the place. And uh, people began, uh, just rows upon rows of people just fell out under the Spirit. Um, people um, were just set free. People that had been in bondage, people that had been uh, into witchcraft. They do. There's a lot of witchcraft, a lot of witch doctors that are uh, in that culture, um, a lot of worship of Buddha. And um, it's just what the power. Power. You could feel it. I don't know how many of y'all have ever been in a service like that where you could just tangibly feel the presence of God. You know, there was an old saying that we used to say, and some of you, uh, you know, uh, Nick, I know you'll remember this, but some of you, because he's old like me, um, the Shekinah glory. We don't hear much about the Shekinah glory. I don't even know what Shekinah means, but it sounds really cool, don't you think? And uh, I, but law has got glory attached to it. But I, I, I just really um, want to encourage you in the word today that no matter what we're going to going through or what we might face, I've heard so much lately about, well, if this party gets in charge or, you know, this country and, you know, this nation. And I will tell you that as long as we lift up the name of Jesus, as long as we praise him, as long as we give him glory, as long as we confess, as long as we put him first, God's going to do some incredible things. Can you say Amen. All right, book of Haggai, we read chapter two, verse nine. I want to talk about the power of perseverance and I want to talk about Coach Haggai or Coach Hag because all of us, um, if we've ever been anything, whether we're learning instruments or we're in athletics or whatever it is or a life coach or a financial coach, um, a good coach will tell you things uh, it will tell you the truth and they will teach you and they will push you to be uh, to do more and to strive more and to reach for more. They will stretch you. They want to get more out of you because they believe that the best is still in you. And I believe that with the church in this country, but I do believe that the church in America needs to be pushed. And uh, we're going to take some lessons from Haggai. God raises up Haggai to motivate his people. And like a coach who will not pacify their weak wills, but will challenge them. And this is some of the things he was challenging them to be. Because if we look, uh, we're going to look at chapter 1. We're not going to read it, but we're going to make reference to it. And, um, but he was challenging them not to be lazy, limp, or lethargic. Not to be disconnected, discouraged, or despondent. But to be movers, shakers, and doers. Not to sit down, to lay down, or to give up. But to sign up, to stand up, and to go out. To go all in because part-time Christians are no match for a full-time devil. Can I say that again? Part-time Christians are no match for a full-time devil. I, I, I'm from Missouri and there's some clear water creeks there. And, but boy, I, you know, rocky and you'd have, we'd swing out into the, the, the creek there and we would have to find those pockets to land in. But if somebody was meddling in the shower, shallows upstream, they just muddied the waters for everything. You see, I believe with all my heart that we've got to get out of the shallows and quit playing in the safety places and get out in the deep and go ahead and plunge in. 
And so, uh, you know, Coach Haggai challenged them, and, but he also challenges us, and his words are, are giving us this challenge, I believe, to the church today. And the first thing that I think he challenged them, but he's also challenging, he would challenge the church today, his words are, number one, quit serving ourselves first. You know, it's not, it's important. I mean, what, our life is important, but we must quit serving ourselves first. You see, today's complacency is tomorrow's captivity. Can I say that again? Today's complacency is tomorrow's captivity. We must quit serving ourselves first. So if we were to look back here in chapter one, uh, one of the first things when Haggai came on the scene and he was assessing uh, the situation of the children of Israel and what they had done, or more importantly, what they hadn't done, because 16 years earlier, they had been sent um, to rebuild the temple. Because of disobedience, they had been uh, taken, uh, you know, from some 70, close to 80 years earlier, they had been taken captive by King Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar went in and he, he invaded Jerusalem. He tore down the walls. They tore down the temple and they took out the, the articles of gold and silver and all the, the loot out of the, the temple. And he took it and he put it in his temple. And he took them captive. And for years they were in captivity till God says, okay, it's time I want to raise up my people and I want them to rebuild the temple. By that time, Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian Empire, had fallen and a new, um, a, a new administration had come in and invaded them. We see that Persia had come in and Persia took over and Persia had a king, Darius, who was um, sensitive and open and so he, he sent the children of Israel back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple and when he did, well, he lined their pockets. He sent not just the articles, the original articles, but he loaded them up with silver and gold and building materials and tools and he gave them everything they needed to do to rebuild the temple and so they went back and they started like a house of fire they started digging the foundation of the temple again and uh, you know it's recorded in uh, the book of Ezra that uh, you know, as they began to, to do this, that they were rejoicing and some of the older folks uh, remembered uh, the glory of Solomon's temple when it was in all of its glory. And um, so they were happy and people were working, but right in the middle of working, they faced resistance. There was opposition to the building of the temple. How many of y'all know that you will always have opposition in your life? Jesus put it this way. He says that in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good courage, for I have overcome the world. How many of y'all know that we face an enemy who doesn't want us to build anything good, doesn't want us to build anything glorious, doesn't want us to build anything powerful because it will be used against him, and so he wants to come in and he wants to divide and conquer and discourage and depress. Are y'all with me? And so uh, they got discouraged and they quit working on the temple. And instead, they started working on their own houses. Now, I don't know where they got the material to work on their own houses. Some historians believe that they took some of the materials that, that were sent uh, to build the temple and they began to use those things meant for the temple and they began to build their own houses. Now, I don't, have, I don't know if that's true or not, but regardless, most of their energy and their efforts were building their own temple and their own houses. And so when the prophet spoke and he came on the scene, he goes, how come they're not building? And they said, well, because now's not the time. And he says, no, it's, you're right, it's not the time, it's past time. He said, now it's time to get busy. He goes, this is why you don't have what you're looking for. This is why you don't have peace. This is why you don't have joy. This is why you don't have hope. This is why you, you, you work so hard to obtain things, but yet all of those things don't make you happy. And, and I'm all for working on your portfolios and our careers um, and, and, you know, all of that. But none of that's really going to make us happy because God doesn't want us to invest in the temporary, but he wants us to invest in the eternal. So he says, you guys need to get back and you need to start building the temple, but you got to quit serving yourselves. And Mark uh, 8, 34 puts it this way. When he had called the, the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. 
John the Baptist, when he was preaching, uh, you know, people were following him and he grew a pretty, a pretty healthy ministry. In fact, if it was today, he would have had a website, he would have had followers and bumper stickers, and he would have had buttons and pins, and a, he would have had it all. He had a great following, uh, but when he, after he baptized Jesus, Jesus began to perform miracles and people began to leave his ministry and go over to the ministry of Jesus. And some, uh, you know, on his, um, his board of directors, um, they uh, were concerned about the loss of uh, followers. And they said, what, what's going on here? How come this is happening? And he said this famous quote where he says, I must decrease and he must increase. When we live in a culture where it always talks about, you know, taking care of ourself. I mean, there's everything's uh, fashioned and, and got about, you know, uh, being happy and, and, and building this and, and growing this. And, and they you know, start setting what the word success is. Uh, but I will tell you that God would, has a different idea of success. In Deuteronomy 26.10, it says, he says, Now behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land which you, O Lord, have given me. And, they, and you shall set it before the Lord your God and worship before the Lord your God. I want to talk about the first fruits here for just a second because um, it's important to understand that God just doesn't ask for everything from you. He asks uh, for, that you give and be a good steward of everything that he's given you, but for you to give back to him your first fruits. This is why I, I think it's so important to come to church on Sunday morning. I'm, that's just, I'm helping you out here, Pastor. Come on Sunday morning. Why? Because it's the first day of the week and it's the first thing you do in the, for, in the morning and giving the Lord the first fruits. Can you imagine? Think about the time. God has given us 24 hours in a day. You think to give God a tenth, a tithe or the first fruits, we should be giving the Lord 2.4 hours per day. I saw a stat the other day that says that the average person um, is on their phone for three hours and 20 minutes a day. And if you look at your phone, I don't know if you have an iPhone, you look at it, you can see how much time you spend on your phone. It, it will shock you. I can't believe I spent 12 hours on my phone today. The average person checks their phone 58 times a day. Now, I, I, I would have never thought that was true, but I, how many of y'all have ever turned around and gone back and gotten your phone? How many of y'all have ever almost called the sheriff when you lost your phone trying to find your phone because everything's on it? Y'all with me now. But how many of y'all have ever turned around, uh, you know, on your way to church because you forgot your Bible? How many of y'all have ever felt like calling the sheriff when you lost your Bible and you couldn't find it and you couldn't live without it? Come on, somebody. That'll make your liver quiver. You think about that for very long. I mean, it's important that we give God time. It's important that we understand that this is not about we. God wants us to love ourselves. Make no doubt about it. God wants us to have good self-image. God wants us to, to think positive because he thinks positive about us. And he loves us. And he wants to remind us, yes, that he loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son. He wants us to be confident and to be strong. But he also wants us to put him first. Because if you seek him first, if you seek him and his righteousness, then all these other things, all these other things will be added unto it. And if we can just put him first, and this is what the, 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 the children of Israel didn't do, they quit putting God first. And if we're not careful, we do it in church and, and just coming to church. But sometimes we put our desires and our wants and our styles and our cultures and everything else. And we, we live in this culture that really is dyslexic. Because now everybody's got a title or ha has some type of, of, of um, you know, something attached to it. Like we're now black Christians or white Christians or American Christians. You with me now? And we've got it backwards. We should be Christians that are black or Christians that are white or Christians that are Asians or Christians that are Hispanic or Christian. You know, you understand, on putting God first. Can you imagine if we put God first, what kind of church are you? We're, well, we're a Christian church. Everybody wants to have this, you know, we talk so much about identity politics, but I will tell you, there's a lot of identity Christian going on and we've, we've divided into so many different subgroups that it actually has divided the church. And everybody's trying to find their identity. You know who our identity should be found in? It should be found in Christ, in Christ alone. Everything springs off of that. So our identity is found, you know, in him. And so we should quit 
serving ourselves first. Number two, we should quit feeling sorry for ourselves. If we go back to our text and, and we look here at chapter two and verse three, um, Haggai, Coach Haggai asked some important question. It's important to ask questions, by the way. Sometimes we always want answers and we're looking for the right answers, but uh, we really should be asking the right questions. He says, who was left among you who saw this temple? There were, uh, there were seasoned people there, people um, you know, that had seen the former glory. And this is the question that he asked them because so often we hear about the good old days. We hear about, I remember the days when you know, we would pray through and we would storm the altars. And I remember the days when, you know, I also remember the days when no one ever locked their, their doors. <laughs> left your keys in the car. Not too many people do that anymore. I'm not going to meddle anymore. I'll just get stick here. But he says, who left among you saw the temple in his former glory? And then he asked the question, how do you see it now? How do you see the church now? How do you see the church? Let me tell you, um, let me read to you a, um, a letter um, actually, it was a book written by Francis Chan. It's, and it's from his um, uh, book called Letters to the Church. He said, God's church started as a radical, spiritual, intimate gathering of believers that ultimately changed history. Yet millions today are content to be more observers at church. Many more have left brokenhearted and cynical, but God is waking up his people, people who will risk anything and sacrifice everything to be the dynamic, world-changing church of Scripture. I do believe that we have to ask the question, how do we see church? What is the purpose of church? Is it to get? Is it to give? Is it to go? What, what is it? What am I? What, is my, what am I supposed to do? Do we want to make a difference? We have to ask ourselves a question. What am I doing? I had to ask myself as a pastor. I enjoyed my church. I, I loved pastoring. But I began to ask myself that question. What am I supposed to be doing? And when you start asking God what his thoughts are, what he wants, what his will is, he's going to tell you. Because when you ask God, as you said, for a, a, a bread, he's not going to give you stone. He's going to give you his heart. He's going to give you your thoughts. And so these people had began to feel sorry for themselves. And he asked him, how do you see it now? In comparison with it, is this not in your eyes as nothing? The children of Israel had come to the point. They, they remembered the four glory. The, the older folks kept talking about how glorious it was and how beautiful it was and how much the presence of God moved there. And the newer folks were there trying to build and they were fa facing resistance and nothing was going right. And everything they tried to do, it just didn't seem like it was making any difference. And they came to the point, they began to feel sorry for themselves and we just can't do this. It's not the right culture. It's not the right time. It's not ever going to be like it used to be. It's just, it's, just not, it's just not the same. And they felt sorry for themselves, and so they quit. And for 16 years, there was no saws and no hammers and no digging and no working. There was no progress made on the temple. And God sent Coach Haggai to light a fire under them and to motivate them. And he said, I want you to look and I want you to see. And, and so none of that happened for 16 years. They had felt sorry for themselves. And I think he said this, hey, you guys, you got to quit feeling sorry for yourself. I've said that to a lot of people in counseling. Sometimes Christian people, they should be the happiest people, the most hopeful people, the most faithful people, the most people with the most joy. And instead, they're some of the most discouraging people, the most hopeless people, uh, the most depressing people you want to be around. I, I, sometimes I don't even want to be around Christians. And sometimes we got to feel, quit feeling sorry for ourselves. In this world, you'll have trouble. You, how many of y'all know, how many of y'all have had trouble? And when you have trouble, what does that mean? Sometimes the only way we know just how powerful and just how strong and just how good God is is for us to face trouble and for him to, as Pastor Lauren said, to save us from trouble and out of trouble and to get us through it. Quit feeling sorry for ourselves. John 16, 33. 
In this world, you'll have trouble, but be of good courage. Why? Because I have overcome the world. Romans 8, 33 through 35. Let me read it for you. Who, who will separate us from the love of Christ? So tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or pearl or sword. And as it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are counted as sleep to the, uh, sheep to the slaughter. Isn't that encouraging? I mean, if that scripture ended there and a lot of people just stop reading, they get down to that part, they read that um, about distress and persecution and famine and nakedness and peril and about the sword and, you know, oh my, it's just going to be, it's all over with. You know, if, if Biden gets in, it's all over with. Well, I got news for you. Jesus is bigger than Biden. I hope he doesn't get in either. I'm sorry if you don't agree with that or not. But, but you know, if he does, he does. I believe Jesus can handle him. Come on, y'all say amen? amen. But I tell you what, he's, God's speaking to the church and says, man, it's time, to, it's time to quit feeling sorry for yourself. We've become more passionate about our second amendment rights than we are about the second commandment. And that's the truth. I'm not saying be passionate. I have guns. I have no problem. Some of you are packing right now. And I'm, you know, if somebody comes in here, I'm glad you're packing. I don't have a problem with that. What I do have a problem is when you're more passionate about that than you are with Christ. You can quote, uh, you know, more, you know, types of guns and, you know, ammo and how the velocity on, and we forget the whole time. There's nothing faster than light, though. Come on. It can, light can circle the earth seven times in one second. Light moves because it's made up of photons, but darkness can't because it has no matter. Darkness is stagnant. The only way darkness to, can exist is in the absence of light. We should be excited about that. That should really float our boat. That should really motivate us. And, and, and I'm not saying don't do this. I'm not saying don't be political. Don't stand up. You should. I think the church needs always been political, and it needs to be political, and it needs to let its voice be heard, especially when it comes to the unborn. And the reason why stuff happens is because people don't stand up and don't lift up their voice and speak the truth. So I hope you speak the truth, but we got to quit feeling sorry for ourselves and thinking that we can't do this, that it's not going to happen because the rest of that verse says, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing should be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Somebody say a hearty amen. amen. Because we got to quit falling so and far for ourselves. We serve God. We're red hot. We're blood bought. We're Bible thumping. We're pew jumping. We're devil shoving. Jesus loving. We ought to be able to motivate and be motivated. And we shouldn't have to always depend on the world or the judicial system or the political system to make us happy or not. Because we all should understand, the church should understand that we are powerful and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. It cannot withstand the onslaught of the church. It's supposed to be powerful. It's supposed to be mighty. It's supposed to be awesome. It's supposed to be faith-filled. It's supposed to be joy-giving. It's supposed to be life-giving. It's supposed to be the voice of God. It's supposed to be the hope of the world. It's supposed to be the hope of this nation. We've got to be roused up, fired up, jacked up, we need to stand up. You know, when, when God, uh, you know, poured out his spirit on the church, those people had, had stood down, hidden, backed up. But when they got filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, they stood up and they spoke up and they went out because they quit feeling sorry for themselves. We have got to get fired up again. While God's people are waiting for the Lord to come down, the Lord is waiting for his people to stand up. Can I say it again? We keep waiting for the Lord to come down, but he wants his people to stand up. Maybe the Lord is, you know, he always says, you know, wait upon the Lord. Those that wait upon the Lord shall, shall be renewed. Come on. But you know what? I think there's times that the Lord waits on us. 
Hey, look, I've done my part, man. I've said it, here it is. I've laid it out before you. I've put it out there. I've made a way where there is no way. I have, I have gone before you and I've defeated your enemies. I'm for you and not against you and there's nothing that you can do. You're more than a conqueror. I've said these things to you. Now, the ball is in your court. The move is yours. Quit feeling sorry for yourself. The church needs to quit d- diminishing itself and saying we are dynamic and we shouldn't be diminished. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And so he told them, he asked them that question. Is it not in your eyes as nothing? But in verse four, he turns the corner. Coach Haggai giving them motivation. He also understands that his pep talk to them won't be enough. I mean, they had this governor by the name of Zerubbabel that was a pretty strong political leader. How many of y'all remember that... Zerubbabel was encouraged when it says, and they said, Zerubbabel, you're going to do this, but it's not going to be by might nor by spirit. I mean, not by might nor by power, but it's going to be what? It's going to be by my spirit, saith the Lord. We got to get back to hearing thus saith the Lord. Do you hear the Lord? Do you write it down? Are you writing? I mean, all of us ought to have. Now it's all here. It's right here. If you have one of these and almost every one, you can be driving down the road. You don't even have to write it, man. Just push the button. I'm going to do it for you right here. Just push the button. And it's my notes. And on my notes here, I got to have my glasses. But I just hit the little arrow. And so I could have that on driving down the road. And guess what? God says, you know, uh, Mike, you're, uh, you're not weak. You're strong. So I push it here, and I just push, Mike, you're not weak, you're strong. Right there, baby, look at that. Come on, somebody. And so when I'm going through, uh, I'm going through a challenge, and my faith is being challenged, I hit that note and say, God told me on Sunday, on my way home uh, from, from Front Royal, on my way to Dinwiddie, um, back home, that, uh, Mike, uh, I'm for you, not against you. You're, you're, you're not weak, you're strong. You're not, you're not the tail, you're the head. You're, you're, you're not in jail, but you're free. Come on, somebody. I mean, God is speaking, thus saith the Lord. Uh, you know, we understand we have his written word and we need to be uh, reading it. Uh, we should be checking in uh, on the good book more than we are the Facebook. We need to be, uh, you know, tapping it and, and you know, it's all there. There's really no excuse why. I mean, I, how many of y'all got a Bible app on your phone? Come on, somebody. So, so you can have reminders upon reminders. It, you don't even have to read it. It'll read it for you. That'll make your spine whine. Well, your liver was quivering earlier. Now your spine is whining. I don't know what's next, but, but uh, come on. So he's going to turn to Coach Haggai. I said, I, I, I got I to gotta change the, the tone here. I've gotta, I'm trying to motivate him, and he understood the motivation would only last. It was short term. It's important. Once again, you're going to be going out of here, and I hope you've been motivated. But we need to go beyond motivation And we need to be involved in inspiration. And in verse 4, and this is going to be my last point here, I promise. And I'm going to let you go practice what you've heard me preach. But it's really important that we we get back to work. That's number 3, getting back to work. Look at verse 4. It says, "Yet yet now be strong. Everybody say strong. I don't know if you're strong right now or not. I think maybe you answer that question. Am I strong? Am I strong in my faith? Am I strong in my convictions? Am I strong in the Lord? Am I strong in, in my life? You know, there's, there's seasons in our life. There's hardship. It's difficult. I would say moms out there with small children, boy, what a tough season. You know, what a, what a, what a hard season. When special, I don't know if they're back to school here or not. I know they are here, but I don't know. You know, it's just a tough time. You know, maybe you're here and you lost your job or maybe you're here and your health has been challenged. You know, when, boy, when your physical health is challenged and you don't feel good, it's hard to be happy don't you, when you don't feel good, isn't it? It's hard to be happy when bad things happen, when, when trouble comes. But be, be of good courage. 
And so he said to them, he said, be strong. He says, and then he said again, be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong. You think the Lord's trying to get a message through here? Three times in one verse, be strong, be strong, be strong. And he says, and all of you people of the land, says the Lord, and then he says what? And what? Work. Look at the text there. Work. Get back to work. Build the kingdom. Build the temple. Now, you, we all know here that, you know, we don't have a temple. This is, you know, something incredible happened, you know, when Jesus came and, and he, he, the church was born, then we became the temple. How many of y'all know that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit? And it is, we got to work on us. We got to build ourselves up. We got to lay a foundation. We got to make sure the foundation is right and we got to be, begin to build on it and we got to keep adding to it and we got to keep building and working and redecorating. Some of y'all need a little paint, by the way. Come on, you need to tear down some old things that are wobbly and put up some new things that are strong. Y'all with me? It's always, it's always constant. We, it's, a, it's a process. Sanctification, uh, we're, we're sanctified instantly when we're born. We're separated when we're born again, but then the process of continually being sanctified is progressive in our life. God is always working on us. The kids used to sing it all the time. Said it only took them, you know, week, you know, to make Jupiters and Mars and the stars and all that other stuff, you know, a day, but it, now he's working on us and he's still working on me and he's still working on you. And when you fall down, get up. When you get discouraged, find a place to, to get recouraged. That might not be a word, but I'm going to say it. Recouraged. Is that a word? Recouraged. Be recouraged. Lauren, is that a word? He says it's a word. It's a word. Trust me. Recouraged. I'll ask Amanda, is that a word? Recouraged? No. It is now, okay? Be recouraged in the Lord. Thus saith Mike. So he said, work. He's still, in, he's still in, you know, motivating them. Work. But now we start getting the inspiration. For I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. Verse five, according to the word that I coveted with you, coveted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. If we're not careful, we read over stuff like that and say, my spirit remains among you. And so it's really important that the Holy Spirit is present. Remember, when God birthed the church, the early church, he called a group of people together. The, the temple had been torn down. The body of Christ was not existing. He called the church together and he goes, I want you to go and I want you to tarry until you be empowered. This is what it said in, in Acts. It says this here in Acts Chapter one, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be my witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the other parts of the earth. How do we overcome evil? We do it with good. Don't be overcome with evil, Romans tells us, but overcome evil with good. How, how do we build in our life? We can be motivated, but I tell you, we need something. We don't need willpower. We need real power. Willpower comes from us. It's being motivated. It's having our, our minds encouraged. Hopefully, you've, you've, you know, you've been stirred up. You know, the gifts of God have been stirred up within you, but it's really, really important that the church and the culture that we live in, no matter what happens on Tuesday, no matter what happens, no matter what laws are passed or not, we showed you, we tried to show you a little bit of that video of the, of mostly that younger generation of Vietnamese that was in Hanoi, Vietnam. Who everybody just thought nothing good could ever happen there. But God had a different idea and a different plan. And he began to raise up a church he began to raise up a, a group of believers that in the face of adversity, in the face of, of a system that says they couldn't, many had sacrificed their life. 
the good friend that I went with to Vietnam the first time, the, the Vietnamese pastor. He took us all to a spa on our last day there. He wanted to treat us all. He went to this spa. And I, you know, he had shared his testimony a little bit, but he's 70 some years old and just going every day. And I, 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 we were in the locker room getting ready to go into the spa and he took off his shirt. And on his back was just scars, scars. Where he had been beaten repeatedly. He spent over 20 years in prison in Vietnam for preaching the gospel. And they kept having to move him from prison to prison because every prison that he went to, he would begin leading people to Christ, guards and inmates. So finally, they decided they would, they would move him into a woman's prison where there were no men, just him. They thought that would be it. He would be in isolation. These women were hardened criminals. And wouldn't you know it, he began to lead these women to the Lord and they began to lead women to the Lord. So finally they sentenced him to death and they sent him to the infamous Hanoi Hilton. I, I, I went and visited the Hanoi Hilton when I was there. I have pictures on my phone where they would sit on these wood boards and they would put their feet through stocks and they would put their hands through the stocks and they would be sitting up for days and days and days feeding them contaminated water and pumpkin soup, spoiled pumpkin soup. Many died. Yet at midnight, oftentimes, my friend Paul that was his name, Paul. He would be found singing hymns. And the inmates would hear this. And they would be curious. How could someone have power and peace in the midst of some most death and destruction? You see, there was more than motivation. Your motivation had to have gone out the window a long time ago. I don't know how many lashes on your back it would take. I don't know how many things you would have to lose. I don't know if a government comes in and they start taking all this, what it would cause us to break us. But motivation would soon wear thin. Let me tell you what doesn't, doesn't ever run out. It's always enough. And that's the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And when that early church went and gathered up in that upper room, remember, Jesus had been crucified. Many were hiding just a few days earlier. They were hiding in fear. These weren't perfect people. They were marred and scarred and flawed, weak. But yet they tarried in that upper room and the scripture says that the Holy Spirit as cloven tongues of fire began to set on each one of them. And they began to speak in tongues as the Spirit of the Lord gave them utterance. That group of weak and fragile, dis easily discouraged, well at that moment they were recouraged. And they stood up boldly and they began to speak in these languages that they did not know and did not understand. Yet in the streets, people from all different nations and all different places began to hear the gospel in a language that they understood. And they saw the people speaking it and they knew that they couldn't have learned that, that this had only come from God. Why is it so important that the church gets inspired because we've got to begin 
to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through us that regardless of what happens and regardless of what's going on is that the, that the church is still strong, that Jesus is still on the throne, that we are still capable of doing all that Christ has given us to do. We must build the church first. First and foremost, it's got to be number one on your agenda. Christ can't be number two. Christ can't be, you know, in the mix. It's got to be first. I don't know where you're at. I don't know where, you know, I love the heart of this church. I do, but I don't, I don't know where you're at today personally. But this morning, let's make sure that we put him first. Let's make sure that we, we don't feel sorry for ourselves. Let's work. Let's build. Let's build. You know, if it's here, we need forgiveness. If you have something in your life that needs forgiveness of sin, do you realize it's been paid for already? It's already been, the penalty of that has already been paid for. It's like a gift that someone gives you. Someone else bought and paid for it and gives you this gift. And you, the first thing you got to do is you got to receive that gift. Second thing you gotta do is you gotta open that gift. Then you gotta take it out and you gotta, you gotta use that gift. And then you gotta give that gift away. This morning, if we're here, if, if we have sin or we've blown it or whatever, you know, we've gone lukewarm or we've gone cold or calloused or, or you know, discouraged or dep- whatever it is, and God just restores that in just a second. That's all it takes is quicker than a second. You say, oh, Lord, thank you. I receive it. I receive it. If you hear all, I mean, we don't have to do these special exercises of bowing hearts and signing cards and meeting somebody afterward. Those are all good things. Coming to an altar right, right now, right here. In fact, wherever you're at, Maybe you're driving down the road. And maybe you're at work. Maybe you're at home. Maybe you're at a hospital. Right there. You, things can be made right so fast. So fast. Just saying, God, you're right. And I'm not, and I need your righteousness. And when you do that, you put another brick on that, on that wall that you're building, on that, that, that temple that you're building. Then you go out and you give somebody what the Lord has given you. You give them grace and you give them mercy and you give them quick forgiveness and you don't hold them to account. And you, you see what I'm saying? And you start adding bricks to your life. That's how God builds us up. God's really, 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 really calling the church now to wake up, stand up, speak up, to use its gifts, stirring up gifts. Some of you here, you just, if I ask you, what are you doing in the kingdom? What are you doing for him? What would your answer be? Why is it the church is always short on workers? Why? I don't care how old you are. My mom is 83 year old and she has dementia. She called me this morning on my way. She thought it was Friday, November the 6th. But you know what my mama does? She prays for me. I'm her boy. And she prays for me. I think that's her ministry now. She may not be able to remember everything and anybody, but she remembers me. And there might be a time when she doesn't remember me. Even then, even if she gets to the point where she doesn't remember me, as long as she has breath, she can praise him. I had a little lady came up to me a few years ago and handed me a coin purse. Inside of that purse was full of change, $3.27. She gave me everything that she had. She wanted me to buy some food for hungry children. 
<laughs> and she looked like she needed food for herself. What are we doing in the kingdom? What are you doing in the kingdom? What is your ministry in the kingdom? It's not just to occupy space. It's not just to survive. What are you doing in the kingdom? What, what are you doing now? You're praying? you helping people? What are you doing? Find a need and fill it. Find a need and fill it. Jesus, I thank you so much. Thank you for the extreme patience of this wonderful church, these wonderful people. I pray, Father, that maybe some of the words that I've shared have motivated them. Father, only you can inspire them. I pray, Father, that we would run after you and seek after you. Father, I pray that we would Father, not get caught up in the culture. That we not get caught up in the climate of in the fear and the discouragement. Father, we would turn our eyes on you and that we would we would reach and touch the hem of your garment, that we would press in, that we would run for and run after. Father, that we would be willing to sell all that we have, to sell out, to go all in, to do everything that we can. That we would be determined and that we would pray and ask for the power to persevere. This morning, right where you're at, if you need forgiveness, it's forgiven. If you acknowledge him, you, you, you say, yes, Lord, I need it. It's done right now. Right where you're at, right there, it's done. I pray that you would press, you would press in and you would seek the power of God, more power to do his work so that you could be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Father, we love you. We need you this morning. We give you glory. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I appreciate Mike a lot. Uh, I hope that you stop by this table on the way out. But I want to, I want to leave you with a challenge. I think those were powerful points from the Lord. Don't be lazy. Don't feel sorry for yourself, and work. Get up off your butt and work. I can't say it as good as he does. So I'm going to present a challenge to you. Part of what we do, our struggle. Not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and wickedness in the evil places. We want to work on November the 13th. And I challenge each and every one of you to clear your calendar. To make that the most important thing that day that you could do. That you can come in here with your fellowship and bring somebody with you. And pray together. And praise together and worship together. I challenge you to do that. And I hope that you will.